The Patia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. Barraclough. We've been really, really privileged to have him as a speaker a number of times. Uh, do you want to do the, I think we'll wait till afterwards to do the new members and introduce yourself? I think so. So um, he gave, I, I've said this before, he gave the most electrifying start to any speech I've ever heard anywhere at any time. It was on dengue fever, I think the first talk he gave at the club. And uh, it started off with Oh, I'll, I'll ask the question for you. Who here has, has had dengue fever? Put your hand up, right? Right? So it's like these sorts of numbers. People's jaws dropped, and then he said, so there's about uh, 80 people in the room, say, 40 of you have had dengue fever and don't know it. After that, you could have heard a pin drop, right? It was like, uh, because apparently, I learnt this from this man, the first mosquito you get bitten by, there's four different strains of dengue, no problem. You think you've got the flu, but you don't have a running nose. If you get bitten by a different strain of dengue fever, that's when you get the hemorrhagic dengue fever and you go to hospital. So uh, I, I've now set a very high bar for you to live up, <laughs> up to Dr. Andy Barraclough. And he's going to come here and give a talk sometime about his amazing life as well and the work he still does in Thailand. But this talk, of course, is about the COVID vaccine, facts, fears, and fictions. I hand it over to Dr. Andy. Thank you so much for coming. Big round of applause for one of our best ever speakers. That's good, so I need to stay in one place when I'm talking here. Good morning, greetings, welcome to everyone. Okay, that's good there, okay, right. It's quite an action-packed talk. There's a lot of information on every slide. I'm gonna go through very quickly to allow time for discussion at the end. I'd ask you to please keep questions, comments to the end, when I'll try and answer, and I'll stay behind for a little bit longer to discuss with any people particular issues. I regret I have to read this in full. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter, okay, and do not necessarily represent official policy or positions of any of the organizers and bodies to which he is or has been associated. The material in this presentation is a general background information about COVID vaccinations. It is given in outline and summary form and does not purport to be complete. In particular, there are aspects of vaccinations which I do not mention which might be appropriate and or important for your specific condition. This presentation was created for informational purposes only. It must not be considered or used as medical clinical advice or a personal or specific medical recommendation. The content of this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read in this presentation. For older people with chronic diseases, you are especially cautioned to consult a medical practitioner before receiving a COVID vaccination. Okay, that's got the legal stuff out the way. I am Prof. Andy Barraclough. I do not undertake clinical practice in Thailand. I do not provide individual medical clinical advice. It's no good coming to see me in the gentleman's urinals at Jameson's pub and asking how you are. You don't get that. Okay. I have taken money from anyone who couldn't run away fast enough in order to undertake COVID vaccination work particularly UN agencies, the World Bank, the Global Fund, and more recently, GOAN, the Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network. The majority of material in this presentation is in the public domain. It is not my work, it is not what I have done. 
and you will find URL links to most of it online. Where possible, I have cited those links. The overall approach I use to this subject is to try and use lay language, to use general terms, and to simplify. I use the same approach to medical professionals as well, and to try and add a touch of humor. Please be assured I'm not trying to talk down to anyone, I'm just trying to lighten what can be an over-serious subject. So please, smile along with me as we go through. The situation is dynamic and changing almost by the day. What was known in January is suddenly out of date and no longer applies. Most of the information in this presentation is about six days old. So, it can change a little bit. Do look at the links and get the latest information for those who are particularly interested. Okay, let's start with a schematic of the COVID virus. It's called COVID because it's supposed to look like a crown. It is a baronial crown. Students of heraldry will know kings get crowns with spikes on, but barons get knobs on their crown. And the key point around this is that it's got knobs on. That's the key point of coronavirus. It's got knobs on. More correctly, they should be called the spike glycoprotein, often just called the protein spike. Please also take a look at the little membrane protein, the green bits, because I'm going to talk about those a little bit later as well. Okay. The point about these knobs for COVID-19 is that they are especially sticky knobs. Indeed, they're about 20 times more sticky than SARS. So SARS was also a coronavirus, but COVID-19, the knobs are much stickier. And I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by that. The way that COVID infects the body is it binds to a protein on the outside of cells called the ACE2 protein. This protein is present particularly on the ciliated epithelial cells, which basically means the hairy bits. This protein acts like a cup, a receptor. The knobs on the virus fit physically and chemically into this cup. Those knobs act as the key to the door. They open the door to get into the cell. That's how COVID works. So, the point about COVID is the knobs stick to the hairy bits. I see some of you had that problem as well. <laughs> ACE2 is vital for body function. It helps to regulate processes such as blood pressure. It promotes wound healing and it controls the rate of inflammation. One of the major problems in COVID infections is runaway inflammation because this protein has been closed down by the virus. The human immune system is exceptionally complex, and I'm going to try and simplify it massively by saying it's in two main parts. The innate system, which kicks in immediately and starts fighting the virus, and the adaptive system, which produces antibodies and which takes time. For COVID, we think it takes about two weeks. Not certain, there's still some research going on around that about two weeks to produce antibodies. The flow is sort of sequential. You start with the innate system, but there is overlap and there's other mechanisms and other functions going on as well. The innate system, part one. Okay. I'm going to use a term I call the display cabinet. When the virus enters a human cell, the virus is no longer visible to the body's immune system. It's hidden, but the human cell has a defense mechanism. It displays proteins from that virus on the outside of the cell. It's as if it ran a display cabinet. Hey, look what I've got inside me. Okay. What does that mean? You grow your own knobs on your cells. This protein is put on the outside of the cell. The body can then recognize that as an antigen, as a foreigner, and produce antibodies to it. That's part of the defense mechanism of the body. 
part two, in addition to that, the cells produce interferon. Interferons do lots of things. They shut down protein synthesis in the cell, so the cell can't make more knobs. It warns other cells that there's a virus in the area, and it presses the start button on the immune system ramp up. Well, that's all very good, it's all very technical. What does it actually mean? It means you might never get to the adaptive stage of the immune system. Often, the innate immune system is enough to control the infection. I never produce the antibodies. It's taken care of in part one. So if I'm going to produce a vaccine, I have to be able to get past the innate system and trigger the adaptive system. Otherwise, I'm not going to ever get the antibodies. If I don't get the antibodies, there is no memory of the disease. I can get repeated infections again and again and again because the innate system is taking care of it. I'm not getting to part two. Okay, so what do the antibodies do? Basically, we can think of them as stoppy stickies. They stop the knob sticking. They bound to the outside of the virus. Additionally, they cause the virus to clump together, agglutination. And finally, they press the unzip button on the virus. That was the little green protein we saw at the start. And that means the virus spills its guts out. <coughs> Since it's not inside a cell, it can't infect anything and it's taken care of by the innate system. So antibodies really deliver a punch. They stop the virus working, they help to destroy the virus, they clump it together making it easier for the innate system to remove it. So how do vaccines work? Vaccines work by promoting the production of antibodies. Point around this, the antibody is not for the whole virus. It's only for a little bit of the virus, what we call the antigen. In the case of COVID, that's the knobs, because they're on the outside. The antibodies fit to the knobs. So what does that mean is, I only actually need the knobs. I don't need the whole virus to be able to produce a vaccine. And indeed, most vaccines around the world for COVID have been produced just on emails of genetic code. They didn't transfer viruses all around the world in order to produce it. I'll explain more about that, but the key point is the antibodies bind to the knobs. I only need the knobs to produce the vaccine. Vaccines, we have three main approaches. Of course, there's always someone who's gonna go outside the box, so there's two or three other ones, but we're gonna ignore those for now and keep to these three main ones. Using the whole virus or bacteria, using subunits of the virus, that's the parts that trigger the antibodies, or using the genetic material. And all three approaches are in use. The whole virus is being done by Sinopharm in China and Sinovac. AstraZeneca and the Sputnik V from Russia are using the knobs. And genetic material is from Biotech, Pfizer and Moderna and many others. If I look at the whole microbe approach, there are within that approach three different types. Vaccines are not really alive, so I can't say I killed them, but I'm going to use this lay term and say I've killed it. I've inactivated the virus. That's the type of material we use for influenza vaccine and polio. I can use a live active, active virus, but I've weakened it taken the pickaxe handle and beaten it around the head enough times that it's going to behave. And that's the kind that we use for measles and chicken pox. Or I can use a viral vector vaccine, which was developed for Ebola. And I'm going to explain more about the viral vector in a few slides time. So three different major approaches to producing the vaccines. If I take the parts, I'm going to use the knobs from the outside of the vaccine. The problem with that is, how do I get the knobs inside the cell? Before, I had a virus to carry them. 
if I'm going to use just the knobs, how do I get it inside the cell? And a new technique developed for anti-cancer drugs uses solid lipid nanoparticles. So a lipid is a kind of fatty soap. If you've ever washed with palm olive soap, you know it's soapy and greasy at the same time. Okay. So this fatty soap is used to get through the cell membrane. It's a minute particle, it's a very high technology, it's a recent technique, but it does work. It develops, so I put my knobs inside this soap bubble, the soap bubble delivers them into the cell. And that's an approach being used by the University of Pittsburgh in their lipid nanoparticle vaccine, not yet released for use. Okay. Another approach is to use the viral vector approach, which I'll explain next. In the viral vector, I take a harmless virus. In the case of AstraZeneca, that was a virus that causes influenza in chimpanzees. I stop that vaccine reproducing. I take out the bits of the genetic code that reproduce, and I splice into the, vaccine, into the virus the genetic instructions for COVID knobs, just the knobs. We then inject you with that virus. That virus carries the instruction for the knobs into your cells. Your cells then produce the knobs on the outside, which trigger the antibody production. AstraZeneca used a chimpanzee influenza virus. The uh, Russian Sputnik V used a human cold virus, an influenza virus called an adenovirus very high technology to get a little bit of genetic code. So I'm using a completely different virus to carry a genetic code into your cell, which will produce COVID knobs, which your cell defense mechanism will then display on the outside of the cell, and that should trigger antibody production. The Russians with Sputnik V have taken this a step further because they use two different viruses. In the first vaccination, they use adenose 26 virus. When you go for the second vaccination, it's a different virus. They use adenose 5 virus. They believe that by using two different viruses, you get a higher penetration. You get a greater level of antibody production. There is also a clinical trial taking place using one vaccination from AstraZeneca and one from the Sputnik V to see if that will also increase the odds. Next technique is to use genetic material. And again, I'm not using the whole virus genetic material. I'm taking only the little bit that produces the spike protein, the knobs. Yep. Yep, OK. Good. We OK there? Yep, OK. Again, I have the same problem. How do I get that little bit of genetic material into the cell? And again, I use the solid lipid nanoparticles. I wrap it into this salt bubble. The vegetarians will be pleased to know the lipids that we used are all derived from plant materials. There's no pork dripping involved in our vaccine production. Okay. So this is really high tech. RNA is very delicate. It doesn't exist well outside cells, so all these vaccines require very cold storage temperature. Minus 20 for the Moderna vaccine, minus 70 for the Pfizer biotech vaccine. Because it's very delicate material to exist outside the cell, even when it's wrapped in this lipid nanoparticle. So what types of vaccine in development? If you look along the bottom there, you see, viral vector is towards the top. Nearly 50 different organizations trying to develop viral vector vaccines. Why is that so common? Because it's open source material. The technique for viral vector using the chimpanzee influenza virus was developed for Ebola. It's published its open source. Protein subunits are next, inactive virus, and then so on down the list. 
why have we got so many vaccines in development? Because there's no guarantee. We've been trying to develop a malaria vaccine for 30 years. We've got a vaccine now, it's sort of okay, it's not very good. The reality is only about 7% of the vaccine candidates, not just for COVID, but for all diseases in general, only about 7% ever get through the lab tests to make it to clinical trials. Of those that make it to clinical trials, only about 20% ever get through the clinical trials. That means of the candidates, only 1.5% ever make it into the marketplace. That's why you have so many involved in producing the vaccine. Because you're not sure which technique is going to work for this particular disease until you go and try it. What does this mean? There's an awful lot of vaccines gone in the bin, about 300. But nobody's talking about that. Everyone's talking about how fast you've developed the vaccine and it's not safe. What about the 300 that went in the bin? And some big names went in the bin. And a lot of money wasted to develop that vaccine. The vaccine development process is really in three phases. We start off with phase one, which is laboratory studies. And that often progresses into animal studies. If the rats don't die, then you move on to phase two, trying it on real people, typically about 100 people. Costs about $15 million to try that. And you use mainly young, fit, healthy adults. If nobody dies, you go on to phase two. Costs about $25 million and you typically use about a thousand people and what you're trying to do now is determine the dosage which is the optimal dosage nobody dies you go on to phase three and now you do about thirty thousand people half get the vaccine and half don't and you compare the results among the two groups and you look for all the different side effects and if that comes out good then the vaccine can be released onto the market well, you can see the time scale along the top here, two to five years for the lab, a year for phase one, two years for phase two, many years for phase three. How is it you've made a COVID vaccine in a year? How is that possible? Well, really, that's the wrong question. What we should be asking is why does it take you so long to make a vaccine? Because most of the time, you're not doing anything. Most of the time, you're waiting. You're waiting for funding. You write a grant application, it gets sent in, it gets sent back, it gets lost, it gets found, it's recycled as firelighters somewhere. They give you 50% of the grant you asked for. You can't do half a clinical trial. Now you've got to go and find somebody else. By the time you've got your second sponsor, the first one's withdrawn. Yeah. That's just the money. You've got to get regulatory approval. Well, the regulatory approval only takes about a week, four to five days typically. But you're in the queue, and it's six to nine months in the queue to get your request to the top of the pile. You can't take a risk on the money because it's tight all the time. So you've got to wait to get the money before you can start recruiting volunteers, before you can start making trial vaccines to go through a lot of time is wasted. So has the vaccine development been rushed? How can it be done so quickly? Well, of course, the number one reason is money. And the number two reason is money. And the number three, four, and five reasons are money. Firstly, there was a lot of money. The US alone put 700 million in. The UK about the same. The EU threatened to pay, and I'm not sure they ever did. <coughs> okay. Okay. So from the US, nine billion. For malaria vaccine, we've had 700 million over 30 years. We're saving up for a down payment on a new test tube. Okay. And we've got nine, not only that, 
This was high risk money. What did that mean? As soon as the lab test showed the vaccine might work, went ahead and produced the vaccine enough for phase one and two clinical trials. A number of companies had to dump that vaccine. They paid for it to be produced, but they never got through phase one trials. That went in the bin. That money was wasted. So the agreement on the money wasn't just big money. It was high risk big money. And that really impacted across the whole area. Take the risk, don't wait. Start recruiting the volunteers now. Use the money now. So the minute you've got regulatory approval, bang, you can start the clinical trial. It's made a huge difference. Around the vaccines, bear in mind, techniques were developed for the Ebola vaccine. That really pioneered the way for rapid vaccine production. So that was known about. Also, because of SARS and MERS, the COVID virus was known about. So the technique of viral vector was known about, open source, published information. It was there ready. WHO had also started a program of disease X, which was to have available ready a vaccine platform. So when the next pandemic disease hits, we're all ready to go. That work was not complete. But at least it had started. Some of the basics were there. They never expected it would be COVID. They thought it would be a new kind of Ebola. So it wasn't really focused around that, but at least some basic information and some of the techniques were available. The regulatory authorities which give permission were on board from the start. We didn't have to wait nine months for regulatory approval. It was there straight away. So key message, lots of money, and we knew about sticky knobs. But let's not pretend everything is wonderful and great. All the approvals granted so far for the vaccines are emergency use listings. That's different to full level approvals. Less data is required for those. If you're really interested in it, you can watch a video from WHO which explains the process on the emergency use. So they're only allowed for use because of the emergency conditions. And there have been major differences between East and West in how they approach the authorization of the vaccines. It appears clear that the Russian vaccines were in use before phase three trials had even started. The Chinese vaccines were in use before phase two trials had started. Okay. Quite different approaches between East and West. Sputnik V Russian ones were in use before trials were completed, data has now been published on the Sputnik V. That's not to say that the Chinese vaccines are bad in any way, just that they seem to have using a different system for the West. In the West, all the data was published, but frankly, a lot of it was very messy, particularly around the AstraZeneca vaccine. Some people even called it a dog's breakfast because they messed up the dosing cycle through it consensus opinion, it was just enough to scrape through an emergency use listing. Since that time, much better data is available, and it now qualifies easily for emergency use listing. But it's not been an easy path. COVID vaccines, there are currently, as of the 5th of March, 261 in development. The link is here, you can check it out, it's updated twice a week. In January, there were 291, and there are 13 vaccines already in use around the world. The churn is around 50 per month, around 25 drop off, and about 20 new ones come on each month. But remember our 1.5%. Out of this 261, we can expect perhaps three new vaccines to make it to market. There are 13 vaccines known to be in use. The ZF2001 in Uzbekistan is probably not going to command world attention, <coughs> um, but other ones are well known to you. EUL is emergency use listing by WHO. People misunderstand. WHO does not go around looking for vaccines 
to add to its authorised list. The manufacturer must apply for emergency use listing. If they do, then it can be granted if all the conditions are met. So there's a wide variety of vaccines around and in use. How do the vaccines compare? AstraZeneca is normal refrigerator, that is two to eight degrees storage. Needs two doses, depending on which particular set of data, between 60 and 90% effective. The Moderna vaccine, which is an RNA vaccine, two doses, 95% effective, must be stored at minus 20. Pfizer Biotech, also an RNA vaccine, two doses, 95% effective, must be stored at minus 70 degrees centigrade. The Russian Gamleya Sputnik V or Sputnik V, depending on your particular way of announcing it, a viral vector vaccine, 92%, again stored at two to eight degrees. How does vaccine effectiveness compare over on the left? are the influenza vaccines, generally around 60% for an influenza vaccine, and most of the COVID vaccines are around the 60 to 90% mark. People misunderstand. Everyone says, I want the 95% vaccine. Maybe you do. But from a public health perspective, anything above 50% works. It will address the epidemic. It will have an impact. So shouldn't get too hung up about the particular percentage effectiveness. Compare that with measles and polio vaccines around about 97, 99% effective. What's the cost? Well, okay, AstraZeneca, these are only indicative prices. There's a big price range available around those. It's believed the European Union screwed the price down to $2.30 for AstraZeneca which may be why they can't get any delivery. <laughs> and some people are charging over $60 for the Moderna vaccine. But there's a wide range. The WHO COVAX scheme is using the AstraZeneca vaccine mainly because it's the cheapest. Under the terms of their agreement, they will produce at cost until the pandemic is com declared over. Then they go back to a commercial footing. For now, that's a big price difference between that and the others. How are we doing on vaccinating the world? Israel leads the field. We're getting on for 60%, closely followed by the UK, and then so on down the list. So over 40 million vaccines have been given worldwide. Okay. If there was major activity, if there was major problems, I think we would know. Okay, a few myth busters to go through, just because there is so much misinformation out there. Okay. This is pretty obviously fake news, which says you must have the vaccination into the penis, which might be a problem for the ladies. <coughs> Maybe it's a special service you get in Soy 6, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's lots of rubbish out. Please be careful. Please check the facts out there. There has been a fake news website in Thailand in English purporting to register you on the Line app. There are genuine Line apps for registering for vaccination. They are in Thai. That's the More Prom app, Line app that will register you in Thai language for the vaccination. It's not clear if foreigners can register on it seems to be geared towards ties only. We await more information on it. That is genuine, but there are line apps around trying to get your personal information for COVID vaccines. Please do take care. COVID cannot be transmitted by mosquitoes. The outbreaks of new diseases in Thailand from mosquitoes is chikungunya. It's not a new disease. It's been in Thailand for at least 30 years. It is, however, increasing, particularly in Rayong and in the south. If you want to know about chikungunya, that will have to be another presentation at another time. But 
Mosquitoes do not transmit COVID. Can I have the vaccine if I have got diabetes, cancer, hypertension? The answer is almost certainly yes, and you should. But, and it is an important but, you must take your clinician's, your physician's advice for your specific condition. It's important. It might be as simple as changing the time you take your medication or organizing the time of the vaccination at a time to fit in between your other medication. It's important because you're more vulnerable, but it does need a little bit of consideration, which is why if you've got comorbidities, you need to consult with the physician first. Am I too big or too small to receive the vaccine? Well, <laughs> I sometimes wonder why white-haired old professors labor long into the night to produce vaccination charts and needle sizes and syringes and guidance, because certainly nobody in Japan ever read them. They have wasted millions of doses of vaccine because they got the wrong sizes of syringe great pity they don't ever read any of the information. It's also claimed the Pfizer vaccine is less effective in obese people. It might be. But one of the reasons also might be that currently all the COVID vaccinations are intramuscular. That is into the muscle. Many of the vaccinations are intradermal, just under the skin, or subcutaneous, a little bit deeper in the skin. This is right into the muscle. So, for people who are obese, and as a very rough guide, that means more than 120 kilos, yeah, you might need a longer needle. And that advice is given and recommended, shown on all the charts and all the briefings and all the trainings that we do online for COVID, particularly in the Southeast Asia region where we have multilingual training in how to administer the vaccine larger people might need a larger size needle to get through into the muscle. Very low weight people, the muscle might not be enough, might not be large enough, so the vaccination can be given into the thigh, and low weight we generally mean below 40 kilos. Those are only rough guides, of course it depends on your height and body mass index overall, but they are things to take into account when having the vaccination. Religious concerns, well, why would there be any religious concerns here? Well, some of the vaccines, not all, are developed from a cell line which originally came from aborted fetal material. These abortions were carried out generally in Europe in the late 60s and early 70s. No new abortions are involved. No material from the fetus is involved in the vaccine. It is a cell line which came from those materials. That cell line is a clone of a clone of a clone been going on for the last 40 years. Not the original material. However, there are religious concerns around that, and that cell line is also used to develop other vaccines as well, particularly hep A and shingles. Okay? Those vaccines which do not use, those COVID vaccines, which do not use those cell lines for manufacture, are usually tested against those cell lines to see if they work. That's part of the lab testing stage. So here you can see a chart and the reference which links all the different vaccines which are derived from those cell lines which are tested against those cell lines. So that is the basis for the religious concern. We have consulted with all the major religious authorities and the majority of the religious authorities have given their permission and authorization for the vaccines. They are aware of the source material and they have granted their permission for it. Okay. For those Brits from the UK of a whimsical nature, in the 2001 and 2011 census, 
more than 350,000 of you declared that your religion was Jedi, which made Jedi the fourth largest religion in England and Wales. Now, I couldn't get hold of Master Yoda, but we have statements from George Takai, Commander Sulu, and C-3PO to say, all you droids, please get the vaccine. So may the fast be with you. These RNA vaccines are going to affect my DNA. No, they're not. The RNA involved in the vaccines doesn't enter the nucleus of the cell, it's in the outside of the cell. You're not going to turn into Frankenstein if you have the vaccine. A burning question for many of you, can you have a drink before and after the vaccination? And for one or two in here, I suspect during the vaccination. Mm. This depends who you talk to. The UK and Russia said no alcohol for 48 hours before and 14 days afterwards. The USA says there's no indication that it affects the immune system at all. Just remember to bring a beer for the vaccinator. I would suggest, there's no official guide for Thailand at the moment, but I would suggest restraining for 48 hours after the vaccination would be a good move because side effects generally are increased in the presence of alcohol. It's not that alcohol causes any side effects, it just makes them a little more prominent. Can the over 80s have the vaccination? Yes. Well, over 80s have died. Well, I have news for you, over 80s die every day. In Europe, about one in 15 die every year. Okay, in this age group, we have to expect death rate and compare that death rate. If we look at the high vaccination level countries, Israel and the UK, we're seeing reduced deaths among the over 80s. Are there any long-term effects? If I have the vaccine, will I test positive for COVID? Well, that depends what kind of test you have. The antibody test, yes, you will test positive. On the PCR test, no, you will not test positive for COVID. That protects, that detects the presence of virus. If I've had COVID, should I still be vaccinated? The current advice is yes, still be vaccinated. Okay, I've just talked about the throat swabs. Will it affect the throat swabs? If you really want more information, there's a link to the WHO website there explaining how it will affect COVID tests after vaccination. Do I still have to go into isolation if I get COVID? Yes. The, first vac the time between the first vaccination and the second vaccination is still possible to contract the disease. If that happens, then you will have to go into isolation don't know, am I going to need the vaccination every year? We don't know. Will the vaccination stop me transmitting the virus? We don't know. Okay, thank you for sitting through the presentation and smiling along with me. I'll try and take any questions. Well, uh, I, d I can't speak for everybody, but I thought that presentation was absolutely fantastic. And I wasn't lying Brian. about the world-class world uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, what I would say, and what I really jumped up was, just one question per person. If you've got more than one question, uh, if there's time, we'll come back to yours. But one question when you get up. Uh, if you've got allergies, food insensitivities, intolerances, should you avoid having the vaccine? Not the COVID vaccine. The influenza vaccine, yeah. I know that you've got problems with eggs. There are no eggs involved in the COVID vaccines. However, as always, check with the clinician on the particular one. So remember these lipid nanoparticles are usually plant-based extracts. So if you're allergic to palm oil, just possibly there could be some reaction. I don't know. Thank you, Doctor, for the very interesting uh, presentation. My question is, what happens, if anything, if on the uh, uh, 
biotech Pfizer administers uh, is the wrong temperature. Administer, of course, it has to be very cold. Uh, what happens if it is administered at the wrong temperature? Okay, two parts. The, the vaccine is stored at minus 70. The, it comes with what's called a vaccine vial monitor, which is a color-coded temperature-sensitive button on the top of the vial. Once it's out of minus 70, you can't oh administer yeah. it to you at minus 70. It's a block of ice. Okay, You'll have to wait for it to reach round about 2 degrees. Okay, And that is a problem, because if you don't have a large number of people to vaccinate, you're going to waste the vaccine. It's good for about 24 hours outside minus 70. If it's stored at 2 to 8, the latest advice is it's good for 48 hours. So you could keep it in the fridge for a day if you need it to prefer to take it out, it must reach at least two degrees before you try to vaccinate it. I would prefer it to be at room temperature before it's vaccinated. Okay. When you inject into the muscle, remember these are intramuscular injections, they're going right inside the muscle. If it's cold, it can cause cramping in the muscle. So it's better to be at room temperature. But then you need to have a long queue of people, sorry, long queue moving through very quickly. Okay, you can ask. It's all right. It's okay. It's all right. Hi. That, that was great. I heard that vitamin D3 is good for your immune system. So how much should you have? If you're living in Thailand and you've got vitamin D deficiency, you're spending too long in the go-go bars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole country is ablaze with sunlight all the time. You, really, it's unlikely that you've got vitamin D deficiency unless you have a particular medical condition. If you want to take vitamin supplements, a general multivitamin is fine. But no more than that, unless you have a specific vitamin condition, deficiency condition. Most people don't. They're trying to use vitamins to boost the immune system. That doesn't work. Lack of vitamins reduces the immune system. Excess vitamins does not boost the immune system. Lack of them, yes. But in a normal diet and with this amount of sunlight, you shouldn't be having vitamin D deficiency. Okay. If a person acquired natural immunity through uh, contracting corona yep. coronavirus, yep. Uh, is it uh, recommendable to still to to get vaccinated? Or the official advice from WHO is yes, you should still be vaccinated. I don't try to defend that decision. I state it for what it is. Hi, um, there's a lot of reports about false negatives for testing. That would be a concern for people who need to get on a plane. Could you say anything about that? Okay, um, there's lots of problems around the PCR test. The PCR test is exceptionally sensitive. And there are false positives occurring in the PCR test, absolutely. There's no really gold standard test for COVID. PCR is just very sensitive and it's going to take time to get better at it. Some of the early tests, there were many false positives. The newer test kits are slightly better. There's less false positives, but it still happens. Andy, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to suggest that the World Health Organization set up a standing $1 million to the first doctor, nurse, researcher, or otherwise to alert us to the next pandemic. <laughs> and also, $100,000 to the first uh, person suggesting any measure which reduces the reproduction ratio by a measurable amount. Because everything, you if you had 10 people coming up with suggestions like that, that's only a million dollars. 
the cost of this pandemic is of the order of 10 trillion, okay? The US just passed 2 million as aid to get the place back on the road. Thanks. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Uh, I would, unfortunately. I think World Health Organization, uh, it's not something within their mindset, within their organization and bureaucracy, they could even consider. The world needs a global health organization. I'm not sure WHO can respond to pandemics like this effectively. Yes, um, all of the COVID injections you listed are experimental. And uh, for example, the Moderna is uh, study completion date October 2022. Pfizer is January 2023. And from one of the charts, uh, you mentioned that none of the vax makers are liable for injuries and deaths related to the injection, which they'll, which they all deny immediately. Yeah. Anyway, so it has to be demonstrated. So. My question for you and for the audience is, how do you feel about being a guinea pig in human trials? Okay, we take that in two parts. The phase three trials were around 30,000 people. So, I agree, the vaccine do not have full registration. They have emergency use listing. They would not qualify time in December when most of them were given emergency use listing for full registration. Further studies are needed. Yes, we're taking the risk on emergency use listing. Absolutely. We might address the problem more to China and Russia which decided that they didn't even need phase two and three trials to go to people. <coughs> but yeah, it's a risk. You have to be willing to accept emergency use listing. However, we're now at 40 million people. I think that's a reasonable body of evidence coming along. The Moderna and the Pfizer-BioTech vaccines are the first of their type, the RNA in lipid nanoparticles. So they're very new. Again, they have achieved emergency use listing, so it's a case of balancing the risk. What's the risk of COVID? What's the risk of the vaccine? The risk from the vaccine appears very low. The risk from COVID depends on the country and the circumstances. In Brazil, the risk from COVID is huge. Here in Thailand, it's small. Balance the risk according to the circumstances and make your decision. Okay, Bob. Uh, yes, uh, can you tell us the latest on the uh, blood clotting issue? Right, okay. This is complicated because people are using general terms around this. They're using blood clotting. This is not simple blood clotting that has been reported. It's a very rare form of blood clotting. It is with exceptionally low platelet counts. If you've got an exceptionally low platelet count, you shouldn't be able to get blood clotting. So something strange is going on. So it needs investigating, and it has been investigated. WHO are supposed to deliver on Thursday their opinion, but they're saying in the meantime, in high incidence countries, we should continue with the vaccination. It's a decision I agree with. In high incidence countries, we should continue because the risk, public health is about risk management. What's the risk from COVID? What's the risk from the vaccine? If the risk from COVID is higher, continue with the vaccine. Right now, it's so specialized in this area, we can't clearly tell. It's not a simple case of blood clots. People get strokes, blood clots, that's true. This is a little bit of a weird one. It needs more and deeper investigation. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, very good information. Um, I have, uh, uh, just first a comment. Uh, most of my family back in the United States has already gotten the vaccination and no uh, problems so far. So. Uh, so far, so far, so good. Um, my question is uh, for another vaccine uh, for uh, hepatitis. When I was traveling around the world, I got the uh, hepatitis vaccine as a precaution, but I was a 
three-time non-responder. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what is the non-responder um, threshold for, uh, for the vaccines uh, so far for the, for the coronavirus? Okay, well, it's on the antibody test, which is a laminar flow test. If you're showing negative on the laminar flow test, then you're not responding. Okay, and for the hepatitis vaccine, if you're a not responder, then at the uh, vaccination travel center at Macedon University Clinic uh, has a special technique to help non-responders to hepatitis vaccine. Okay, so uh, is it a, a, a visible problem on the, uh, so far with this a series or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, the, none of the vaccines are 100%. You're seeing that some reports show only 60%, some reports are showing 90%. Not everybody responds. The point is you don't necessarily, from a public health perspective, yeah, got it, got it. you don't need everybody to respond. Okay. okay, thank you. If you can do more than 50% of the population for COVID, you're probably doing enough. Just a note to everybody, please be a bit patient. We're trying to get round to everybody. And I know a lot of you had your hands up, but you know, there's only two of us. With all the different vaccines that are available, is there any one particular vaccine that you would recommend? Um, or is that uh, a very personal uh, <laughs> well, choice? I, my, my personal choice is to go for the Johnson & Johnson because it's a single shot but that's just for convenience. I mean, I'll, I'll take the first one that's available. I'll even take the Chinese vaccine. Um, on the Russian Sputnik V vaccine, yeah. it was the first one on the market, I think, and we don't really hear much about it. Do you, yes. know, do you know much about it? How is it performed? Are there people dying? Or yeah, it, it's available. It's been donated to a number of countries. It's been registered in a number of countries. It does appear to work. The data has now been published for the phase three clinical trials, and it does appear to be above 90% effective. We are still waiting for the data on the Chinese vaccines to be published. Right. Because they, they used the vaccine before they'd completed the clinical trials, which is a um, novel approach to vaccine development. Right. Uh, first, I'm very impressed at your knowledge and expertise on this. I mean, it struck me when you spoke about the blood clots, uh, it's been quite noticeable the British media didn't pick up on the complexity of this um, whereas you know professors in the Netherlands and in Germany have picked up on the fact that it's a very rare type of blood clotting so I was really impressed at that that you were on top of that uh, somebody was questioning the liability my understanding from what I've read and I do stand to be corrected, is that one reason the European Union was so slow in its negotiations was that they insisted that manufacturers take full liability, whereas in Britain, for example, they didn't insist on that. So my understanding is that manufacturers do have liability uh, for those people who are very concerned that there's no liability on the part of the companies, my understanding is that they do have liability in many cases. It's not as clear cut as that, unfortunately. Uh, it, it's rather more complicated and it's linked with the authorization level. So because the national medicine regulatory authorities involved are complex, particularly in the EU, because you've got the European Medicines Agency, and then you've got the national agencies involved as well. It is around the level that they've authorized. Right now, it's emergency use listing. It's not full authorization. Under EUL, you've already got limited liability on the manufacturer. So just by the virtue of the fact that it's EUL and not fully regulated, the liability is already limited. Then they've negotiated on top of that. And it's 
different countries, medicines agencies have done different things. It, it, it's really a dog's breakfast across Europe on the liability. I wouldn't like to hazard where it will go. Hi Andy, what are your views on an individual having two vaccinations of different types? Is there a benefit? I, it, it's, okay. I would suggest that if you want a second vaccination, you have an antibody test to see if you've got antibodies. If you've developed antibodies, there's no point with a second vaccination. Every vaccination carries a risk. It might be a small risk, but it is a risk. You should not be stacking up your risks if you don't need them. If the antibody test comes back negative, then it's worth considering Hi, I uh, read the Pfizer application and how they calculated the 95% effectiveness. H however, when I look at the numbers <coughs> globally, you have about 10% of the population that, or five, getting COVID. Of those people that test positive, 95% or 90% are asymptomatic. Of the 10% that are symptomatic, 10% of those are seriously ill and whatever percent die. How do you calculate 95% efficiency when such a small percentage of people actually get sick? Yeah, it, it's a real I understand challenge. the statistics of yeah. the application. And that, that's why they're only under emergency use listing. There hasn't been a large enough data pool to look at full registration. Unfortunately, the calculation of the efficiency is beset by which organization undertook the clinical trial. So it's very difficult to compare them. You're comparing AstraZeneca with Moderna. The trials were done by entirely different, and they used entirely different mechanisms for calculating the efficiency. And even the same vaccine, like AstraZeneca, the trials undertaken in different countries by different organizations have come back with entirely different numbers, partly because it is a very small percentage, but also because they use entirely different techniques for calculating the efficiency effectiveness of it. So it, it's a mess. Thank you for your well laid out presentation. It was just, uh, just excellent. Uh, what do you, what kind of vaccine do you think we're going to get if we stay here in Thailand and get shot? And what do you think the chances of the Johnson vaccine making it here? And have you got any idea of what the timetable would be for people like us? Uh, pass me the tea leaves and we'll have it. <laughs> I, I suspect the vaccine likely to be available will be the AstraZeneca made in Thailand. I suspect. Okay. When? My best guess would be July, August. It might be made available. Johnson & Johnson, the registration has to be applied for by the manufacturer. So J&J must apply in Thailand to the regulatory authority to have their vaccine registered. At the moment, there's no commercial incentive to do that. They can't meet the demand they've got now. Why would they spend time and money on trying to open a new market which will be a low-income market anyway. So I can't say it won't happen, but I'd be surprised if it's quick. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. and Doctor. Um, how much data is available to researchers who would like to assess the effects of a coronavirus vaccine on young people? On young people? simple answer is very little and by that I mean people under 16 years of age for some countries under 15 years of age vaccine has not been tested there is a trial going on now in the UK which is I'm afraid to say deliberately infecting school children with COVID to see how effective the vaccine might be over here yeah, um, okay, if we're talking about, let, let's take it in tiers, yeah? Above 80s, there's now good information from Israel and the UK available. Above 65, a reasonable body 
The main clinical trials were done on 20 to 50 year olds, so they're in that group, there's lots of information there. Under 16, as I say, very little is available. If you look on the GAVI site, you'll see a little information, that's G-A-V-I, and on the WHO sites, let me see if I can find the link. Okay. okay, link there on the different vaccines and the types and studies that are available. Okay. And the emergency use listing, the link is there as well. So there is some, but not much on the 16s. Bulk of it is there. It's published information. It's in the Lancet, the journal Lancet. If you have trouble sleeping at night, I recommend reading it. The information is published in the annexes, the appendices to the main journal. So it's not printed, it's only published online. It's a huge document listing all the data and it's quite difficult to go through it. But worth a try if you're interested. I've asked uh, a lot of my Thai friends and acquaintances if they were going to get the uh, shot and a lot of them said no, they're afraid. Either because of uh, fake news are superstitions because Thais are very superstitious. And it makes you wonder how they're ever going to get herd immunity if a lot of them were thinking like that. Uh, there, there certainly is a vaccine hesitancy in Thailand, although generally in Thailand they achieve quite high vaccination rates. So we wait and see what actually happens. The polls that do exist, which are not very reliable, indicate that most people will go for it, but as I say, they're not very reliable. How will you get herd immunity? For COVID, it's estimated that you need more than 60%. So it's not so high. For measles, we need better than 94% because of the infectious nature of measles. COVID is not so infectious. It's believed 60%. The new variants might change that calculation and require higher that's the sort of indicative figure. It's probably possible to achieve that in Thailand. Remember, to get that, the vaccines aren't 100%. You would have to vaccinate 70 to 80% of the population. Okay, well. Andy, uh, a year ago you spoke to us. I would be curious as to what day you spoke to us. Do you remember March, February? I believe it was in March one year ago. The reason I say that, at that time, you spoke to us also about Ebola and some of your past experiences. Mm -hmm. Outside, I asked you point blank about coronavirus and what you thought would happen, and you gave me a very pessimistic point of view. My question to you is, it lived up to your expectation that it would be bad, and have you been surprised that so many people have died, like in the USA, 532,000 also, Next year, will you talk to us, and what will you be saying then? <laughs> okay, let, let's take part one. As COVID lived up, it, it, it's far exceeded my most pessimistic views. The number of deaths are high. I have lost colleagues and friends this year from COVID. Um, so, yes, it's far, far in excess of what we expected, what I expected to happen anyway. Uh, will I come and talk to you next year? My Just one more question. Yeah. I have a friend in Europe. He's got two young children, 11 and 12 years old. Yeah. What is uh, the implications for him traveling to Thailand? Uh, for, for right now, for children, vaccination is not recommended. We wait and see. I expect within about 12 months there will be a vaccination for children. It's debatable whether it's really needed children don't suffer that much from COVID, but for him, he will need to be vaccinated to travel. Children don't. At the outset of your excellent talk, you mentioned the intrinsic um, the immune, immune system immune prior system. to the production yeah. of antibodies. Is there anything uh, we can do to strengthen that intrinsic system? Yes, live a healthy lifestyle, remain active, lay off the booze, stop smoking, lose weight, all the usual stuff that doctors say. Yeah. As we get older, often our immune system weakens. It's important to be aware of your own health, 
and to try and manage that health. Here in Thailand, there are two particular health issues that expatriates don't normally address, and that's iron and iodine. In the soil in Thailand, from Myanmar, Burma, all the way through the Thai Peninsula, down through Malaysia and Indonesia, there's very low levels of iron and iodine in the soil. And that's why Thais from a long time ago used fish sauce. Fish sauce is not just a condiment, it's a medicine. It contains high levels of iron and iodine, and that puts it in your diet. In Western countries, they iodize salt. Because salt wasn't in common use, here it's in the fish sauce. So, put fish sauce on your fish and chips and you'll be okay. <laughs> a very interesting talk, and I know there's a lot more questions, but we're stuck for time. Um, I'd like to congratulate you. Uh, a mass interest and very interesting. One thing I've got to say to you, Doctor, is do you think this is a normal virus that's found a way of changing its uh, way to get into our body, or has it been engineered? I don't believe it has been man-made. I have my own theories about how it came about. I have no evidence for them, so I will not expound. I don't believe it was man-made. I believe it was mutated. But I believe there was some help in the mutation along the way. OK. Well, uh, stay there, Doctor, and I'll uh, present you with this small token of our very deep appreciation. Um, I'm wondering if there's anybody in the audience that didn't learn something today. I, I would think virtually all of us learnt some things today. And the talk, as usual, was just super brilliant and uh, incredibly world class. And we are very privileged to have, have you here again, Doctor. Uh, 